first speaker is Gwen, and we'll like to welcome her, and she's going to give us a very interesting talk about uh, how we should look at play, and that play and our conventional video games uh, has a lot more value than we think it is, uh, and, and would help us, uh, especially a young, younger generation, a lot more. She is the co-founder of IMBA Interactive, uh, and I'm not in the gaming kind of industry, but you know, I trust the people around me, and they say like she's a big hotshot name. Okay, so we're very honoured to have her. Okay, Gwen. Hello. Hi. So uh, first and foremost, thank you so much to Kelvin and Pico for organizing this this awesome talk. And actually, um, even though like a lot of you guys are not from the games industry, but what I'm going to talk about, it, it can be transferred to any form of industry because it's mainly about collaboration, what it means to form a community and uh, what diversity really means. Because these are a lot of words that we throw around very often, you know. I mean, when you think about, you know, in the startup world, there's a lot of these fancy words like disruptive, diversity, collaboration. But do we actually really know what these mean? So um, I'm Gwen from Imba Interactive and um, we, I co-founded this company with two of my other co-founders, Sharon and Jeremy, in the crowd right there. And we do primarily game audio. So what we do is we provide uh, music, sound effects, voiceover for video games. And these are some of the communities that we've been actively trying to pull together. Lah. Um, audio posts, for those of you who don't know, is uh, audio post production. Uh, people that do audio engineering for uh, TVCs, uh, film, video. Um, obviously, that's the games industry. And, and we want to look at education because um, we feel that Education is one of the best ways to promote um, good pipeline, good working pipeline in the games industry and the audio post industry. So um, let me just show you some pictures of, uh, this is Imba Interactive and obviously we love eating a lot. And uh, yeah, every picture of us just eating. Uh. This is the game audio industry, which is clearly not very big in Singapore, but we are trying to make it bigger. This is the audio post industry. Uh, and this is the <laughs> this is the games industry. Sometimes we go rollerblading. Sometimes we go and play Dungeons and Dragons. But and this is the education. What we've been doing, teaching at SP. We've been giving talks. You know, um, particularly I want to note the one at the bottom left. There, it's not very clear, but it's our very first Skype conference with the games industry in Taiwan, and it was surprisingly intimate. And let me show you why. So, okay, for those of you, don't, don't be intimidated. I know it's all Chinese, okay? I'll explain. So, um, what struck me was that when they posted up this blurb on their website, they actually called us Penyo. And for those of you who don't know, Penyo means friend, which is surprisingly intimate for people that we barely met. You know, people that have invited us for talks, you know, we've had such formalities, but they just introduced us as Penyo, which I found quite interesting, you know? I mean, pun you is the same way as calling you like buddy, hey, you know. And as you know, in the in audio industry, it's a very lonely industry. Lah. We just spend our whole day in a dark room in our own mixed lab alone. So like, but actually, this is the whole point of the talk. It is what inspired me because why can't professionalism, you know, when we look at professionalism, why can't it be warm? Like, why must it always be so cold? So let me first explain to you how... Um, let me share with you a very personal story about our company. So our company is like about three years old. And um, if you want to talk about cold, there was this very big argument that we had. It was a uh, first argument I had with Sharon right there. And it was a uh, quite intense argument. Like we were at Yakun Kaya Toast and there was a bit of screaming. People were like eating their toast and they were like, what's going on? And then Jeremy was on his phone and he didn't know what to do. And you know what we were fighting about? We were fighting about... Um, survival versus ethics, our company direction, right? So at a point of time, you know, that's like our first year. Um, each of us were earning probably just $500 each. And like Jeremy and I were, were about to get married, you know, we'll get the BTO. So we were like, okay, let's put survival of the company first. And Sharon was like, no, what about our ethics? What about, you know, we can't just take any job that comes up, you know, because like, like, what, a, what will that make our company look like? And we just had this big fight and it was horrible because, you know what, the end conclusion was at the end of the day, it was a horrible conclusion. The conclusion was that by the time we earn X amount of salary each, then we can come and look at ethics. 
And like, it was terrible, you know. And this is what I mean by what we think collaboration is. Collaboration, you know, a lot of us think, oh, it's just two people coming to share their ideas and like having this middle thing and then we come to a conclusion and then like if anything doesn't work out, we agree to disagree. But the problem is that like this, when we attach our ideas to our identity, right, we don't let anything else in because we are too busy protecting our ideas and therefore our identity. So after that, Sharon and I went back and we went to do a bit of reflection and um, this is something that... Um, I learned from marriage prep. I know it sounds very lame, marriage preparation course, if anybody has heard of it. So in marriage, they taught us about um, when two people get together, it's not no longer about two individuals, it's about forming a third entity. And I felt that this is very, very relevant for startups because like, it's no longer about you and your co-founders anymore. It's about, it's about shared values, it's about common goals. So at the end of the day, when Sharon and I went back to reflect, I was like, hey, actually what she said had immense value because like, if you want to build community, you have to consider a moral compass. You need to, to have a moral uh, compass to, to have all these like, positive energy for the community to grow. And Sharon was like, yeah, I should have been more sensitive and like, understanding towards my co-founder's circumstances. And because now we both understood each other as per new, we both understood each other as friends, we were able to build something completely new and therefore have opportunities come in. And now, like, it's easier said than done because, like, three of us were so different. When you want to talk about diversity, right, everybody just thinks about, oh, you know, let's talk about imposing a gender quota or let's talk about imposing a racial quota in our organization. But at the same time, you know, you know when you go to the stock photos, right, and you look at diversity, then you have all these different people. That, that doesn't mean diversity at all. Because what is the point of diversity if at the end of the day there's different people but there's still hierarchy, there's still like authoritative leadership. And even if you say, no, 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 I give my, uh, I give my subordinates and stuff a lot of autonomy and all that. But because you're in a position of power, sometimes there is glass ceilings that, that you don't realize that are there and it's important to be sensitive to the glass ceilings that occur. So what does it mean to truly embrace diversity? One of it is creating a safe space. What does it mean to create a safe space? It means that everybody, and like, I mean everybody like from interns to bosses to like managers, come together and respect each other's domain of expertise. And when we talk about like leadership, everybody is a leader in their own mind and it's important to understand this. And like, sometimes it's not just about expertise, sometimes it's about traits, valuable traits that you wish to include in this um, circle of diversity. And uh, one example is that um, at Imba, we have had, I think so far, about three interns. But our interns, we don't do stuff like make them pour coffee or like, I don't know, do admin stuff. Because like, it's not only not, it's not, only not solving our problems, but it's also not really giving them dignity and autonomy in what they do. So normally for our interns, we actually give them um, goals and research tasks. So they will learn, like, for example, a game engine, and they will, they will actually form a whole curriculum to teach us, and we give them full autonomy to like, boss us around, to chase us for homework. So that at the end of the day, when they get out from our company to join other companies, at least they have some valuable knowledge that they can pass on that only they know and we know. Another note is that um, along with all these uh, leadership attributes, there are also negative attributes and uh, they are called blockers. And some of these blockers, right, um, a lot of them, they come in and let's say like every, they're contrarians, for example. Every time you contribute to something, they will try to say something else that is not relevant to what you're saying and they effectively block the ideas and all that. And before you move on to having solutions, you have to address the blockers. And we're not talking about addressing them in a rational way, like just shutting them out or kicking them out of the group. Because as you can see, people like with positive traits like coordinators can also be blockers. People who are energizers or encouragers can also be like blockers or aggressors. So like when we want to talk about leadership, let me just put this out here. Um, this is... When you go to Google, right, you just search leadership traits. And uh, these are traits that were defined in 1954 based on uh, desirable military leadership traits. Uh. So as you can see, a lot of them are quite robotic. La. And maybe we can consider something a bit more equal. So on top of these 
highly valued leadership traits. Maybe consider those in block C, those that are like so-called soft skills or passive skills, but can also be considered leadership and should also be recognized on the same level as those that are A and B. So um, the main takeaway for this is that you need to be vulnerable. I mean, given the, the conflict that I brought up with me and my co-founders, if it wasn't for this conflict, right, we wouldn't have come up with our values. You know, we started out wanting to be just a cool game audio startup doing cool audio for video games. But in the end, three years on, we found ourselves like being the main catalyst of community in the games industry and the audio industry. So, and you need to create this safe space to get the ideas coming in. If not, you'll just be protecting yourself all the time. And always remember that emotions need to be addressed before attempting solutions. Because we are human beings and we are not robots. So, I end off with, we need to talk, but we also need to listen. Thank you. Thank you. Before you go off, just a quick question. Um, when, uh, you know, I'm coming from male privilege and male Chinese privilege in this Singapore situation. When, when you started this, in, this company in Singapore, were there any obstacles that you faced from a... Um, uh, discrimination point of view, for example, um, in your industry? In my industry, I think I've been quite privileged that uh, I haven't personally um, experienced this in Singapore. In fact, um, the industry has been nothing but kind. Uh, but at the same time, if somebody else does come up and speak out about discrimination, my, my point of view shouldn't blanket statement all of them. You, know, you should still take their concerns seriously. But I want to share about something I experienced in Hong Kong that mm. was quite like discriminatory la. So um, this one was when I was uh, interning in an audio post-production house in Hong Kong and, and it was really quite disparate la. Like the office were all ladies and those in the studio were all guys and I was the only girl in the studio and, and like people were telling me like why are you doing audio engineering? You should be learning to play the piano instead. Or like <laughs> just go and find a rich man to marry and yeah so Have you? Uh, he's a great guy, that's more important, he's I rich know, in other ways. I'm just kidding, I'm just <laughs> poking fun at him. So, yeah, but that inspired me to come back to Singapore to right. start something new because like, our startup scene and games industry is still relatively young, so yes. we still have the capacity to promote really good values in the industry. So that's why I did. La. I, I, yeah. I think that's awesome what, you, what you're doing. How, um, how, how can we get more of the young to to do what you've done? How can we encourage, uh, how can we get more of your stories out to get more of the young to come into whatever fields they want to do? Because you, you're also not the usual product of the Singaporean system where you go do this. Yeah, um, I think first and foremost, we need to really start to value, like what I said in my talk, we need to start to value different traits from young. The soft skills. Yes, the soft skills. You Which can't, can't be tested. Yeah, you can't, it's not tangible, you can't, mm see it by KPIs and stuff so like like you can't always um, base a child's potential on their academic results for example because then your child will grow up to be that piece of paper yeah exactly and then I, I don't know if any of you have children you don't want your children to grow up as that piece of paper you, you, your child will have a name but you actually look at yeah but your honours your honours degree second yeah, class yeah there's, there's something that I uh, something interesting that I noticed in Singapore because like we travel to different places and Singaporeans whether adults or kids lah, the first thing they ask is what's your job you know what mm. are you working as you know which school do you go to it's, it's not so much about oh let's uh, what music do you listen to you know what's your interest uh, yeah, yeah. yeah what's so, your interest and stuff who are you you know as a person so so, it's so, the, so what you're saying is the questions are the same hard skill questions rather than the questions that try to find out about mm. the, the soft the soft ones mm. that try to find out about and I think overall people need are. to try to understand uh, because it is very easy to put people in boxes for example like uh, my, my husband for example he's like in social work and when people listen the first thing they think about when in social work the first remark they give wow that's a really noble job and then they don't talk about anything else <laughs> it's like, like, I mean, if you ask a person what they're doing, at least be interested in like what they're going through, like what they've learned. It. Exactly. Yeah. Why do you want to pursue social work? You know, what were the, were the setbacks? You know, stuff like that. Lah. Because yeah. maybe after they find out you're in social work, they can't ask the next question like, so what car do you drive? Do you drive a BMW? Yeah. 
<laughs> so um, it, it just means that you we should. I mean, some of the values towards the end. The the, the first one was uh, you were saying very military base, right? There was that if you look at the American election, that's almost Donald Trump kind of thing. And then the other ex end of the spectrum was just being more human again, mm. right? I, thanks. I mean, we'll, you know, this is why we're trying to do this. So we get more of our people coming out to speak and telling our stories and then get more of us to ch start changing our mindsets so that we can, you know, prepare for the future. The future is going to be very different. Uh, like, if you say you, you treat interns with respect, how do you interview them? What do you look out for? Okay, so every single uh, intern that we interview, we have to do a face-to-face. -face. Like, mm. there's no, there's no like email, send us your CV and all that. And even if they have the skills required, right, it's like, we have to see. Like, and, and usually, from meeting them in person, it is easier to scout out what's their potential and their willingness so to what learn. what do you look out for? The willingness to learn, firstly. Mm. Um, secondly... The openness, la, the openness to get whatever feedback, criticism, and initiative is very important. Mm. You know, for us, it's like uh, we can't give you these tasks if you don't take initiative. So, so you're not saying, here's the guidebook, follow this guidebook and follow the steps that you actually no. have to figure out how to get there. Yeah. How do yeah. you think we perform in that arena? In some, the, in? in some of the interns that you've taken on? Mm. Actually, majority of them have been quite. Uh, quite, they, they've been taking quite a bit of initiative like, and even if they didn't, it's not like sometimes we have to change the frame of thinking, right? right? So if our staff is not performing, right? The first reaction shouldn't be it's their fault. You know, there should be a means of understanding why they're like that. Because sometimes the interns are not doing something because they're scared of us or like they're scared to us. They're shy, they're fearful and sometimes we have to reflect, are we creating an environment that's again, is it safe for them to talk about their feelings honestly with us? Or, or they came into your place with a, uh, with a preconceived notion of what a workplace environment yeah. should be. Yeah, right, much. okay. Yeah. Awesome. So thank you very much. Thank Thanks, you. Gwen. Thanks.